Okay, so we've now went to the left side, let's now go to the right side. So let's say that we want to study this first path, the line of sight path, right? Then I can write as a function of t, c of, let's write like this, line of sight as a function of time. And let's suppose that we are moving away from the um, transmitter, so then th this line of sight maybe will kind of go down over time. An important notion for uh, this uh, the change of the channel as a function of time for a fixed delay is the coherence time. And the coherence time tells you uh, for how long is the channel approximately constant. So maybe I can then refine my figure a little bit. So this channel over time is changing slowly, maybe like this. And if I were to zoom in on this and, and just look at a small region, then approximately in this region it is constant. Okay, and approximately in this region it is constant, and here it is constant. So the time for which the channel is approximately constant is known as the coherence time. The time for which the channel stays coherent. But if I were to look at this large time here, this is much larger than the coherence time. Okay, so delay spread and coherence time are both measured in seconds, so they're, they're easy to understand, I think. Each of them has also its inverse, so the inverse of the delay spread is called the coherence bandwidth. This tells you over which band is the channel approximately constant. The inverse of the coherence time is the Doppler spread, and this tells you to what extent is the tone spread in frequency. Okay, so this is, um, once we decide the carrier frequency, we have the certain channel C of tau and T. Now, the next thing we add when we communicate over this channel is the bandwidth. Okay, and this bandwidth will affect how this channel looks at the receiver side. So we choose a certain bandwidth and then we introduce T as one over the bandwidth. This, uh, T tells me, tells us how quickly I'm sending uh, data. So then I end up here in this middle picture. So I've chosen a carrier frequency, which gives me this channel. I've chosen a bandwidth here, which gives me T, which is one over B. And now I can relate this T, which is expressed in seconds to both delay spread and coherence time. So let's first look at the delay spread. If the Let's call this here T, let me call this the symbol time. If the symbol time is much larger than the delay spread, that equals here, so this means I'm sending pulses that are very long, much longer than, for instance, 10 milliseconds. Then I call this communication narrowband or frequency flat. And in this case, the um, pulses overlap. So the pulses corresponding to the channel, they will overlap. We'll see this in a minute in more detail. On the other hand, if T is not greater than the delay spread, then we're in the so-called wideband regime. Okay. So then we will have an effect called intersymbol interference. So this is when we compare um, the symbol time to the delay spread. We can also compare the symbol time to the coherence time. So if the symbol time is much smaller than the coherence time, that means within one coherence time, I can send many symbols. And then the channel appears to be slow. It's called slow fading. On the other hand, if T is on the order of the coherence time, we'll have fast fading. That means the channel changes relatively quickly. Every few symbols, the channel is changing. And now the rest of the lecture is really about the narrow band case, about slow and fast fading. Okay, so we'll work in the case where the symbol duration is much greater than the delay spread of the channel. So for instance, um, if I go back to my, my indoor channel where the delay spread is 10 nanoseconds, let's suppose that T is equal to one second, right? I mean, it's an extreme case, but just as an example. So in that case, if I send a sequence of pulses, so this is time, 
let's see, I send a pulse here and another pulse here, another pulse here, and each of these pulses is one second. Then at the receiver side, what will happen is that the first pulse will arrive, correspond to the line of sight channel, and then there will be multiple reflections, but all of these reflections appear almost at the same time. Okay, so what you will just end up with is uh, you will add all of these paths together, you will have a fluctuation of this power. So then the second pulse is received over line of sight, and then you have all these reflections. So you, you don't see any effect of this channel other than a change in amplitude. And then the third pulse arrives, and all of its copies, its delayed copies, arrive almost at the same time. Right? And this is because 10 nanoseconds is much, much smaller than one second. The receiver will never notice that there's a um, multiple paths in this propagation environment. Good. So then this uh, picture tries to visualize this. So this um, this picture shows C of tau and T. And the first top figure shows the wideband slow fading channel. So this means that if I look at the delay domain, the channel is changing in the delay domain, right? Well, this is um, yeah, this is a bit misleading because this maybe is the received signal. All right, let's see. So this should actually be a sequence of many pulses, right, in the delay domain. But what's important is that there are different pulses in the delay domain. Um, but when I look at the time domain, nothing changes, right? So let's say this is the channel now, this is the channel tomorrow, this is the channel yesterday. It hasn't changed. So this is called a slow fading channel. On the other hand, you could also have a narrow band channel, so where there's only one pulse or one delta function here, but this channel is changing over time. Okay, so this is the narrow band communication that changes over time. And of course, you could have also narrow band that is constant, so then it would just be a, a fixed value. This would be time invariant. But that's a very boring channel. That's basically the additive white Gaussian noise channel, actually. Maybe not very boring, but not interesting from the wireless communication perspective. And then the next lecture, uh, we will look at this more general case where the channel changes over both delay and time domain. Now, to understand maybe in a bit more detail this difference between narrowband and wideband communication, it's interesting to introduce the notion of resolvable paths. Right? Recall this example that I talked about before, where I sent pulses that are each one second long, and then the channel has a delay spread of 10 nanoseconds. Right? So this means that in the delay domain, different pulses are arriving, but their difference is only 10 nanoseconds. Good. Then these paths will not be resolvable by the receiver. The receiver will never know that there are multiple paths. And mathematically, we say that uh, different paths are resolvable when their difference in delay is greater than the symbol duration. So this is equal to T, right? which is 1 over the bandwidth. So if we apply this to our case, so here t is one second, the delay spread is 10 nanoseconds, so this is tau well, last minus tau first is one nanosecond, 10 nanoseconds. And we see that now this, this, equality does, this inequality does not hold, right? So this means that the paths are not resolvable. And when the paths are not resolvable, that means that from the point of view of the receiver, they appear as though their delays are equal. So they appear kind of um, superimposed.
But of course, um, things can change over time. And recall the delay spread is the difference between the, the last and the first path. I think maybe I will do a slightly different example. Let's see. Let's suppose that the channel looks like this. This is tau. This is C of tau. It doesn't change over time. I have a path here with an amplitude of plus one and another path here with an amplitude of minus one. Okay. And I um, sent again th this same signal here with this symbol duration of one second. So what does the receiver see in this case? So this is what the transmitter sends. This is the channel. And now we look at the point of view of the receiver as a function of time. What would the receiver see? So maybe you can think about it for a second and come back. So from the point of view of the receiver, these two paths, they will appear as one. They will be superimposed. So what you will receive is a channel that basically looks as the sum of the two amplitudes. So the channel will look like just zero. So what the receiver will see is zero plus noise. This is what happens when the paths are not resolvable. On the other hand, if the transmitter used um, symbols that are one nanosecond long, then they would be resolved and then the effect would be very different. Right, so um, in this case, the, the channel actually has no delay spread, right? Because the first and last path are, are coinciding. When you do have de a delay spread that is non-zero, this will lead to so-called intersymbol interference. And here, what is important is that we, we're transmitting over the same physical channel, so the carrier frequency is the same, but here we use a bandwidth that is really large, and here we use a bandwidth that is really small. And large and small are measured with respect to the delay spread. So the bandwidth is much larger than 1 over the delay spread, and here the bandwidth is much smaller than 1 over the delay spread. Good, I hope this is uh, becoming clear. So here's another example of uh, resolvable paths. So let's suppose you're given a channel with a delay spread of 10 microseconds. So is this an indoor or an outdoor channel? You can ask yourself that. And now we are communicating over this channel with um, different baud rates. So this is actually, this means that B is equal to 10 megahertz or 10 kilohertz, I think the term baud is a little bit old-fashioned term. And the question is, uh, what is the propagation distance between the first and last path? This kind of relates to this question of indoor versus outdoor, and then also to determine the amount of intersymbol interference. So if I send one symbol or a sequence of symbols at the receiver side, to what extent will one symbol affect other symbols? You can spend a few minutes to think about that, pause the video and then come back. Okay, so 10 microseconds turns out to be uh, 3 kilometers, right? And this follows from the speed of light. And where the speed of light is uh, 0 0.3 meter in 1 nanosecond. Okay, so then based on this, you can figure this out. Um, then now let's look at our two cases. So if B is equal to 10 megahertz, that means T is 1 over B is 0 0.1 microseconds. So here we have symbols that are really short. So if I try to draw this, so this is time. And I'm sending these short pulses like this. I'm just drawing some arbitrary signal. This is what the transmitter is sending. Now this is the channel. The channel has 10 microsecond delay, so that means that well, then we'll have some peaks like this, right? And this difference is 10 microseconds. Oh, that's my timer. Let me just finish this example. 
So here I had one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so then this would also be 10 microseconds. So what does the receiver see as a function of time? So the first pulse will be sent here. So then I will receive the first pulse one time here, according to the line of sight path, right? I will receive the first pulse, a copy of the first pulse, because there's another path here. So I will receive it then maybe like this again. And I'll receive another copy here, another copy here, another copy here. Okay, I'll do my best to draw this. The second pulse was sent here, so that means I will receive the second pulse here. And then I will receive copy, so one copy will be here, another copy here, another copy here, another copy here. And this is the second symbol that I receive. And then the third symbol, to have another color, third symbol would be like this. So then I receive the third symbol here, here. And then, okay, now it starts to really merge into the, the other symbols like this. Um, I think I missed maybe one of them. Anyway, like this, something like this. Right, you see that each symbol is spread out over multiple symbols. So in this case, um, ah, sorry, this would actually be 100 symbols. So this here is 0 0.1 microsecond. Um, and you see that 0 0.1 microseconds, you can fit 100 times into 10 microseconds. So your intersymbol interference would last over 100 symbols. So this yellow guy here would appear you know, in, in some attenuated version up to 100 uh, symbol slots away. So that's the first example. For the second example, when B is 10 kilohertz, that means that T is 100 microseconds. And now the situation changes. So again, let me try to draw this. Each of the pulses will... Okay, so each pulse now has 100 microseconds. In the channel, you will have your line of sight path and then the other paths, but basically they, they will all kind of fit into this 10% of this pulse, right? So this is transmitter, channel, and then the receiver, time at the receiver. So your first pulse will arrive and you will receive it with the sum of the amplitudes of the channel. So this could be zero in the worst case, and then you will have kind of a little bit, 10% overlap with the next pulse, next pulse arrive, 10% overlap with the next pulse and so forth. Okay, so ISI would be very small, basically 10% of the pulse duration. Good, this ends this next part. So I stop the recording.